This lecture will focus on freedom of speech and expression within the larger theme of laws, democracy, and institutions. Um, there are various ways in which we'll try and address the question of free speech. And in trying to address the question of free speech, we don't necessarily look at speech only as a right. Of course, that's going to be a major part of what we are going to be discussing today. But there are various ways in which the question of speech needs to be addressed. Um, some of the things that uh, we'll try and do in the next one hour is look at the meaning of speech. What is it that the word speech stands for? Second, why is it that the prefix of free or the idea of freedom is associated with the category of speech. Uh, third, which is that which is that particular context in which speech as a category attains the status of a right, wherein you you start talking about the right to freedom of speech and expression. Fourth, is free speech an absolute right? If not, what are the ways in which the question of law intersects the idea of freedom of speech and expression. So how does law or legal frameworks regulate the idea of free speech? Next, what has been the role of judicial institutions in regulating the question of speech? So there's one perspective on regulation that comes from laws. There's another perspective on regulation that comes from judiciary. We'll try and capture all of this in the discussion that would follow. Um, why do we uh, look at speech as a very, very central category of rights that we assume as human beings we have? And um, there are two ways in which one can enter this particular debate. Um, though the Indian political thought is more geared towards the idea of freedom as spiritual. Um, Dalton has a wonderful book on his on where he's looking at um, Indian political thinkers, Gandhi, Tagore, Ram Mohan Roy, um, Aurobindo, who have conceptualized freedom. But the conceptualization of freedom there is more otherworldly, more spiritual. Uh, the idea of Freedom as an individual right is something that one draws more from the Western political thought. And which is where I said there are two ways in which one can enter this debate. So Western political thought also offers two particular entry points. First would be the Aristotelian um, idea of speech, where Aristotle believed that there is something peculiar about human beings which separates them from other animals, even though human beings are also animals, but they're political animals. So what is it that separates human beings from other animals? And he, and of course, he was only talking about men as a, a man as a political animal and not women. But how is it that he placed the peculiarity of man as a political animal um, in opposition to other animals? And there he referred to the capability of man as a species who's able to think rationally and deliberate. So man possesses reason, man is rational, man is capable of using that rationality and that rationality founds expression in the act of deliberation. It was this act of deliberation that produces the category of speech. How do you deliberate? You deliberate through the use of speech. And this is what I, what, what Aristotle thought other species did not possess. Now, this, this centrality of speech in conceptualizing the idea of the political man as a political animal is something that places speech at the core of political philosophy. So you need something called the deliberative capacity granted to you by speech in order to realize yourself to the fullest and to become truly political. 
the other entry point comes from the liberal um, tradition. Um, Hobbes Locke to an extent, but largely from J.S. Mill, where speech becomes one of those foundations of individual freedom, foundations of individual liberty, where you exercise the right to speech in order to develop yourself to the fullest. And in this particular framework, other kinds of regulatory authorities, such as society, such as the state, come after the possession of speech as a right by the individual. So individuals create the state and they create the state to guarantee to themselves their natural rights and right to liberty being one of them and an extension of that right to liberty being the right to freedom of speech and expression. So why do you need freedom of speech and expression in this particular framework? Because you can only develop yourself to the fullest and self-development was the main aim of individual existence in the liberal philosophy. If you have the capability to express yourself and then it enters into the entire debate about rationality, autonomy, etc. So even though Aristotle was also talking about similar things like rationality, etc., the ends towards which the category of speech is being used are very different. In the Aristotelian framework, speech is central because it makes man political. In the liberal individualistic framework, speech is central because it helps human beings develop themselves to the fullest, realize their full potential. <clears throat> How does political philosophy then get into the specifics of this particular right, which is the right to freedom of speech and expression? And in order to understand that, we have to navigate through various free speech, quote unquote, free speech theories. Uh, like I'd mentioned in the beginning, we are not taking it for granted that speech will always be free. We are only introducing the idea of free speech and then would get into the complexities of it. What, what is the problem in speech being free? And as a consequence, what are the problems of regulating free speech as well? Let's come first to this particular framework of free speech theories. And, you know, there are several, but uh, I'd like to focus on four particular theories of free speech. Truth, marketplace, autonomy, self-government, four different free speech theories. Um, let's take the first one, the argument from truth, which most of us have read about comes from J.S. Mill. J.S. Mill was looking at as, as speech as one of the three foremost rights. He talked about three particular basic rights of the individuals, freedom of speech, freedom of thought and discussion, which includes speech being first, freedom of taste and preferences being the second, and freedom to unite, freedom to combine being the third. What was his rationale behind uh, looking at freedom of thought and expression as the foremost liberal right? Now, J.S. Mill, as we all are aware, was writing in the background of a majoritarian society. And he thought that much more than governmental arbitrary restrictions. It's the power of the majority to take control over the minority. That's worrisome. And he said that in order to liberate the minority from the suppression of the majority, uh, one needs to allow every individual, including the minorities, the freedom of thought and discussion. And he based this particular, he premised this particular argument on something called the argument from truth. What is that argument from truth? Mill was looking at truth as a utility in the society. Truth is desirable in the society because it enhances uh, the quality of 
life in society utility could be expressed in different terms utility could be happiness utility could be efficiency utility could be efficacy it could be different things but basically it was looking at truth as 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 a desirable thing for the society how does freedom of speech and expression relate to truth so he was of the opinion he gave two propositions he said first if you allow all kinds of expressions to be circulated in the society so mill was talking about two kinds of propositions first that suppose an opinion which is being suppressed in society and by a suppressed opinion he referred to a minority opinion uh, suppose the opinion that is being suppressed in society is possibly true then its suppression denies truth to the society and since truth is a utility it's a desirable thing in the society uh, the suppression of truth would do greater injustice to the society secondly it may be probable that the opinion which is being suppressed is possibly untrue it's false but it's only through its circulation that its falsity would be known to the world so he was looking at the quality the character of every opinion to expose itself in the society if found circulation so he was essentially looking at the autonomy of individuals to be able to differentiate between what is true and what is false now there are a lot of issues um, attached to how mill conceptualizes the idea of truth and falsity we won't have the time to get into uh, the the specifics of the criticism but uh, mill's theory by and large is considered to be a uh, a normative theory which takes a very very objective view about the idea of truth but the others um marketplace autonomy and self government are not necessarily these moralistic free speech theories let's come to the second one which is autonomy this comes from someone called justice holmes who was a judge in uh, the us supreme court and while deciding on a judgment called abrams versus state in 1919 Justice Holmes came up with this idea of the marketplace of ideas. Uh, Justice Holmes thought that the best defense of any particular idea in society is to test it in the marketplace of ideas. So Justice Holmes was comparing society to a marketplace. just as in a marketplace you have competing products and whichever product has the best sellable quality whichever product is found to be best suited to most people wins over the market he similarly thought ideas should be allowed to compete with one another in the society he gave a famous quote saying the best test of truth is the power of the thought to get itself accepted in the competition of the market this was the classic defense of free speech in a truly capitalist setup where the dynamism of the market was compared to uh, the space of a society of course uh just like mills theory suffers with certain kinds of um shortcomings limitations uh justice holmes theory is also with limitations which is that he is not considering the inequalities which are inherent to a marketplace so all ideas would not be allowed perfect circulation and free circulation so ideas that are more powerful that are backed by more resources etc are more likely to win over the marketplace coming to the third free speech theory the third free speech theory comes from someone called thomas canlon this is called the autonomy argument now thomas canlon was inspired by js mill he also termed his theory the millian principle but he's also different from what mill is saying scanlon was someone who based his argument to defend free speech essentially in the autonomy of the individual 
and he said that freedom of speech and expression is desirable just like mill thought that it was desirable in the society but not because it would bring out the truth scanlon was not concerned with the idea of truth he thought that freedom of speech and expression is desirable because it is only through expressing oneself that the individual exercises his or her own autonomy and if you are not allowed to think for yourself to express yourself and there is a regulatory authority that makes that decision on your behalf then it would mean that your autonomy is compromised and since all of these are liberal defenses in the liberal idea of individual the autonomy argument is central individual is rational autonomous if the autonomy of individual is compromised with the potential of the individual is compromised so scanlon would look at a situation wherein you know there's a book that has been published and the state thinks that the book does not deserve to be read because it would have a deleterious impact on the society so government would ban the book now scanlon would say that this is harming the autonomy of the individual because i am as an autonomous rational thinking individual not being given the choice to read the book and then decide whether or not i want to take ideas from that book to my life i should have the liberty to reject what is being proposed to me and no other authority should be able to do that on my behalf that's the argument from autonomy and from here we finally move to the fourth argument which is the argument from self government uh coming from someone called alexander michael john <clears throat> michael john's idea is not a classical liberal defense and it's more towards a democratic defense of free speech and michael john's idea would be considered to be um the most um balanced view of why free speech should be defended in a liberal democratic society so michael john is saying that democracies are self governing uh, systems individuals govern themselves and in order whether through direct democracy or through representative democracy and in order in an order to govern themselves individuals need information <clears throat> more than the right to speak he's focusing on the right to hear right to know and he thought that in order to know you need the right to free expression in the society if people are not allowed to speak their minds freely citizens or public would never get to know the right kind of information that they need in order to practice self government so michael john was looking at this particular aspect of free speech wherein free speech as a right would serve a political function it would make democracy uh, more efficient it would bring democracy closer to people now <clears throat> there are two ways in which different free speech theories can be categorized uh one would be an instrumentalist defense of free speech or what is called a consequence consequentialist defense of free speech what does this mean it means that you need to protect freedom of speech and expression because it leads to something it's instrumental towards something more desirable it the consequence of free speech is something good people like js mill people like alexander michael john belong to this particular framework of consequentialist slash instrumentalist defense of free speech on the other hand people like thomas canlon with his autonomy argument fall in the second category which is the non instrumentalist non consequentialist defense of free speech now in this framework you don't need to protect freedom of speech and expression because it leads to something good even if freedom of speech and expression does not have any consequence it is a desirable value in itself free speech needs to be protected because it 
does good in itself. It's a value for the society to be treasured, to be protected. From the consequentialist and the non-consequentialist, there emerges a certain argument about why speech needs to be protected. So you either protect speech because it would do something good to the society or you protect speech because speech in itself is desirable. It has value. It's normative. This particular argument is counterposed by a particular framework called the framework of harmful speech or there are different uh, words, terminology is given to it, injurious speech, extreme speech, harmful speech, violent speech, all of these. What is this particular framework? This framework is also focusing on the category of speech. The content of this particular framework is also the same as the free speech framework. But they do not affix the idea of freedom to the category of speech. Why? Because they introduce another argument to the category of speech, which is that speech can also be of an extreme character, which may inflict injury on its addressee, which means that speech does not necessarily have to be free. It does not have to be protected. Speech also needs to be regulated, limited, restricted to the extent of getting penalized as well. Speech should also be penalized. This framework of extreme speech eludes any one particular definition because it depends on different jurisdictions. It depends on different uh, legal jurisdictions in countries. Uh, uh, in terms of which kind of expression would they protect and which kind of expression would they forbid. But the larger idea behind injurious slash harmful slash extreme speech is that speech can be harmful, hence needs to be regulated. So this particular framework comes up with the idea of threshold, Igdelis, that Speech can be protected only to the extent that it remains within the threshold, it does not cross the threshold. The moment the speech crosses the threshold, it ceases to be free speech and becomes liable for restriction or even punishment, like I said. Now, moving to this second framework of extreme speech i want to introduce two people to you first jail austin and second judith butler who have amongst themselves and i'm not saying that they necessarily think of speech as extreme or harmful but amongst themselves they have produced a very important debate about when should speech be protected and when should it not let's try and understand what jail austin says first and then move to judith butler jail austin wrote um, a very interesting a very very um, uh, provocative book that was debated for years in the 1960s called how to do things with words and came up with his speech act theory uh, what did he say he he said that all speech is action. All speech either acts through expression or all kinds of speech or expressions result in a certain action. So basically, he was trying to say that when you're speaking, when you're expressing yourself, you're not just speaking or expressing, you're also acting at the same time. And there are two ways in which speech is related to action. Either you act while you speak, so speech in action, or you act as a consequence of speech. So speech resulting in action. 
the example of first kind which is where when you speak you also act are words like i promise thank you i'm sorry what is happening through these words so when i'm saying i i promise i don't have to do anything else to promise i've promised in the act of saying when i say thank you i've thanked you in that expression itself i don't have to do anything else other kinds of examples would be um you know when the judge in the court bangs hammer on the desk to silence people he or she does not need to do anything extra that particular act that particular expression of banging hammer on the desk produces the desired effect produces the action of silencing people in the expression itself it doesn't have to be something else the other kind where action is a consequence of speech could be anything else besides this category where you are not acting through speech but your speech will definitely result in an action like normal conversations so if i'm saying uh you know i'll if if someone tells me i'll slap you what does this mean it means that even though the person has not slapped me in saying i will slap you uh his statement has had certain effect on me so his statement has acted on me either i've got intimidated because the person has said that he will slap me or i've got offended i've 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 been outraged how dare he say this so every speech will always result in some action it will provoke a reaction so there is action always following speech this was j l austin's framework that speech will always be related to action speech is never just about speaking expressing expressing it's also about acting the other person that i said we need to discuss is judith butler who responds to j l austin and butler says that not all kinds of speech are capable of producing action for instance i am a nobody i am saying too many things here whatever i am saying may or may not have any effect on whoever is listening to me why because i as a speaker do not command that kind of power over you as the listener this particular dynamic will change if this was a classroom situation the teacher saying things to the students will have an effect on the students why because the teacher is in the position of power so butler through various kinds of you know criteria as contexts introduces a category called felicitous speech derived from the word felicity what is felicitous um, or what is felicity felicity is anything that is apt suited for the circumstance which is appropriate so what is felicitous speech something that is suited for the circumstance so what is a felicitous speech is uh, felicitous speech is that kind of speech which will suit the circumstance and produce an action those categories of speech which produce an action are termed as felicitous speech but according to butler not every speech will have that kind of effect suppose there's a lunatic on the road who keep shouting who's calling on to people will he be paid heed to perhaps not even though he's speaking he's expressing but his expression will not produce any action why because he does not command that kind of um attention from the people so every speech will not necessarily result in an action so through uh, austin and butler if one goes back to the framework of extreme speech what does one arrive at one arrives at a particular situation wherein one accepts that extreme speech may be a category of unprotected speech 
what is unprotected speech something that does not have legal protection something that is that does not have constitutional protection in indian context it would mean that something that is not protected under article 19 freedom of speech and expression so one does accept that there is something called unprotected speech which is injurious which is harmful hence people should be forbidden in making that kind of expression but through the debate between austin and butler one is also introduced to the idea that everything that appears to be harmful something that everything that appears to produce harmful action every expression that is claimed to produce injurious effect will not necessarily do so because every expression is not not felicitous expression every expression will not provoke an, a reaction from the people hence what needs to be done through the regulatory framework is to be made a distinction between at which level should the threshold be drawn when should a speech which appears to be harmful should actually be prohibited because every speech appearing to be harmful is not necessarily resulting in an action so what is that particular situation which is that particular circumstance at which one would say that the speech is now likely to produce a harmful action hence should be prohibited banned punished restricted whatever and for that one gets into the legal framework legal judicial framework um so from here on i'll get to the question of the constitutional status of freedom of speech and expression in india and how the judicial discourse has responded to the protection being granted to freedom of speech and expression under article 19